say a few words. Hello, thank you, Kevin, and uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this event. Um, if you're not quite sure, I think most people know what the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives is, but I just want to take a, just a couple of moments to, to talk about the, the CCPA in Saskatchewan. So uh, it is a national organization, a research and policy uh, think tank, if you like, and it's created kind of as a counterweight to some of the, the more conservative right-wing think tanks like the Fraser Institute, uh, the Canada West Foundation and such. And it's really, really critical, as you heard um, our guest speaker Kevin talk tonight, about having information and how important it is to have alternative information than what we normally see in the media and um, <coughs> through, through research organizations. In Saskatchewan, and I'll at the, there was a table there, and you might have seen this. Simon has put together this great little prospectus that kind of outlines the work of CCPA, example of some of the research that's been done over the last number of years. And that includes um, uh, a really great three-part series on, on the environment that Peter Preble and Mark Bigelin Pritchard worked on that talked about how our energy use is in the, in the, in the province and what a possible alternative strategy would be for renewable energy. Um, there's been stuff, um, a good report done on liquid privatization that made a lot of headlines nationally as well as provincially. Um, a paper on university affordability, papers on labor law changes, quite a wide range of, of, of documents. They are available on our website, um, so do go there as well. In terms of upcoming work, right now, uh, Simon and uh, retired professor Paul Gingrich have been working on a living wage study, which is uh, going to be a real critical, I think we've never had that, that kind of an assessment of, we know what the minimum wage is, but what would be a, a living wage in the province? And as the province, the, the new labor legislation is gonna be basically freezing minimum wage and then indexing it from that, that point, I think it's gonna be important to talk about what is a living wage. And there's also some work being done, I think, on a prison justice study. So your support is very, very important for CCPA. It's a one-person um, staff-run organization. Simon is our one staff person. He is the pitcher, catcher, batter. He does all of the work. He does the research and the, uh, the publicity and all of the kind of logistics of, of the organization. We have organizational memberships and we have individual members. So if you're not an individual member or you're part of an organization that might be interested in supporting CCPA SAS, I really strongly encourage you to uh, buy a membership. There is a form on this as well. Um, this event tonight is our, one of our annual fundraisers as well. So admission has been free tonight, but we really, really would like to ask uh, for your support tonight to support the organization and there's going to be some boxes that are going to be distributed and just donate what you um, can. Hopefully you can support a lot and, um, and I'm going to leave that to you and we're going to go into questions. Thank you. Okay, surely there's somebody who has a question after all of uh, what uh, Kevin shared. As I said, I invite you. I'm, I'm going to start off because one thing that, that occurred to me as I was listening was you started this office, you had this group of people around you. Was there ever a concern about that sort of fearless work and what it might mean for them and their careers and, and the like? Because it did occur to me that they took some risks along with you. Yeah, unfortunately, there is like a culture of fear in Ottawa right now. So there, there is, you know, I think a lot of public servants are worried about if they speak out. You know, sign here, you read about it, about scientists as an example, and you don't see, a, you know, you don't see a lot of studies like we used to see on websites, you know, from various departments. I think, I think what I was very, very fortunate I was able to, you know, people came. Some, some of these people self-selected to come to this office. And their view, like they looked at, 
uh, they looked at you know job security in a different way. So if, for them, you know, and they, and they looked at job security in the context of if I'm not doing my, you know, if I'm not doing this work, if I'm not working on really important, relevant issues, then my skills are going to erode. So I need to get to a place where I can just, I can do the work, and in, in a very positive environment, I can get the cover that I need to do to do the work, get you know, access to the expertise that I need. Then my skills get better. So that's the real job security. Is not like you know, there may be some short-term pressure, in you know, in from coming from a deputy minister or some department may be reluctant to hire me. Where it was like, what if, what if my skills continue to erode? And so when they came and they were, you know, they immediately we started building models to do economic and fiscal projections and people are costing wars and building capital budget models for infrastructure. People are using these parametric models to cost fighter planes and ships. And then they're doing sustainability analysis like we released today. And everybody said, well, I'm learning a lot. Like, this is fun. I just want to keep doing this. And so this is like real public service. And instead, and in the context, most of these people had worked at finance and Treasury and PCO, and I say, now I get to make it available to everybody. And when people call, I just answer, I pick up the phone and I answer their questions. Like, what a great model. <laughs> <laughs> and the members of Parliament can call, and, and you know, the media can call if they answer, you know, if they are asking questions about the report. And uh, the Canadians call all the time, they call, they send emails. And, you know, and we, it was a busy place, and wow, it's just like a fun place to work. And I think the problem now is that once they get a taste of it, they don't want to go back to, you know, I can't talk to this person because I was told not to talk to this person. Or I can't do this kind of research because it might not be consistent with, you know, with the communications coming out of the Prime Minister's office. It would be very hard to go back. It's kind of, it, is, it was very enlightening for all of us. So, yeah, and then, you know, sometimes I often felt like in terms of accountability when something goes wrong, that sometimes the people, you know, some people took too much, you know, ended up too much on their shoulders. But I would also say the extent that PBO was successful was not because of me. It was because like the people that actually did the work, like the heavy lifting, doing the analysis, working with people in Canada, other parts of countries, writing the papers, and even having the courage to put their names on papers. And having the courage to go to the like, committees to sit at the front of the committees with me and, and like, on F-35 or crime bills. Um, and you know, and to, and to actually to exchange with members of parliament, but what a great job! You know, so why you, you wouldn't want to turn it down? And like you know, we said to the you know, I said to the students today, and Mrs. Roosevelt said that you know, you're not really living until you're living outside your comfort zone, and we all kind of felt it. But it was a yeah, great experience. So what is fear really? I. Uh, Thank you tonight for a great presentation. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I just wanted to comment a bit on, uh, you mentioned earlier in your speech that you were uh, a concern when voter turnout uh, started dropping below 50. And I unfortunately don't share quite the same enthusiasm with our referendum here because we only ended up with 31% of eligible voters that uh, came out. And I'm just, uh, I worked on the campaign with Regina Waterwatch on the yes side for seven months, and I talked to thousands of citizens uh, during that time, and I ran into a lot of uh, apathy and cynicism out there. And I was just curious uh, on, I guess, uh, your opinion on how we can overcome that uh, cynicism, cynicism and apathy that uh, seems to be quite prevalent uh, with populations. Yeah, I mean, first, and I hope you feel very proud of the work that you did on the referendum. Yeah, and because um, if it wasn't for people like you and others, that I don't think you would have had the turnout that you had. And uh, that is what civic engagement was all like. I don't think it's necessarily a win or a loss, but it's it's people like you that get people activated, that knock on people's doors, and say, you know, pay attention. You know, maybe as a result, they read the article and it was a prairie dog. You know that I was just looking at on the issue that you know it just encourages that. So I think that to me, yeah, I think congratulations. And you may, you know, again, you may not get the result, but I think it's it's the way you approached it and it's the way you played it. So, you know, what do we do with apathy and uh, indifference and what I some people call willful blindness? Like people know, like on some of these big issues, like it could be climate change issues or some foreign affairs issues. We know we're doing stuff that's wrong. But we just stick our heads in the sand, just pretend that you know it's going to get better somehow. I just don't want to look at it. And um, 
Like, I think like, that's why this, this university plays such an important role. And um, that's why, you know, the, the education, you know, and, and getting, like, having this opportunity to speak to the journalism students today that are very engaged and you know, play such a big role. Can you turn this around? Well, we certainly can't turn it around without you. Like you have to do, and you have to do, you know, and others that have you know, participated in that just have to feel good about that that is the way it's supposed to be done. Yeah, so maybe a third, maybe you would have liked higher, maybe you would have liked a different, you know, numbers in terms of the split of the vote. What, but you know, I, I just know from what I heard today, I knew nothing about that issue coming from Ottawa. I heard about it all day long. And I read about it, so you did something. Yeah, you raised the bar. They were talking for you. <laughs> and you. Because you were working on this too. And probably a whole bunch of people too. I just want to thank you first for your presentation. It was really fantastic and we really appreciate you coming on tonight. Um, my question is actually about uh, the resources available to scientists and researchers right now. As you know, the Harper government has really scaled back on what is available and for full disclosure, I'm a PhD student here, so it's an area of concern for me. Um, I wanted to know your insight on this issue and uh, what advice you would have for researchers and future researchers trying to get the information that we need to give to policymakers to make informed decisions. Yeah, okay. like for me, when I said early on that, I think like 2000, you know, this fall, the speech in the throne, the debate about priorities, in the election coming in 2015, they're just opportunities. And I think you know, one of the things I learned, unfortunately, some from personal life, some from professional life, but professionally at PBO, you learn, as Einstein's saying, you want to look at difficulties or challenges and see the opportunities. And um, so, like for me, like at, you know, at PBO, they cut our budget. So we would sit back and say, okay, how do we turn this into an opportunity? Or do we just sort of walk, pick up our bags, and go? And so we decided, you know what? Yours truly is going to whine about it. And we're going to explain to people that, you know, there was a deal that was made, you know, with the Parliamentary Budget Officer that, you know, he, that, you know, there was a certain amount of financial due diligence. So I used that as an opportunity to explain. And actually to explain, like, the pressures that are in the system and why you actually need the legislative need, needed to change. Like, if you want dissonance, if, we were, if we're afraid, if we're, you know, if we want to have debate, then you've got to protect it. You want auditor general, generals to be protected, et cetera. So like for scientists, like what a great opportunity. You know, we have our, our speech on the throne and you come out in this sort of discussion, you're an opposition party to say, this is not tolerable, it's not my country. I don't recognize it. You know, we have, you know, science, you know, whether it's in the Arctic or in fresh waters or, you know, in agricultural science or whatever the science is, they need to be going to conferences, they need to be speaking out. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna be something different. So actually, to change the script, change the channel, to me, that's an opportunity. Like to start to say now that 2015 is gonna be different. If you don't like it, um, I don't know. Does anybody like it? <laughs> I wouldn't think you'd show up to this meeting if you kind of you're okay. Ah, those damn scientists. What are they doing? <laughs> I just don't. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of people out here. Like, I mean, you do the math, like, you know, you look at the popular vote and how many people showed up. It doesn't take much to change the script, you know, and but the thing is, start the debate now. And actually, for me, it's not, you know, it's, like, for us, it, it was like a PBO, it wasn't interesting enough to say, you know what, you cut my budget. And, or, you know, or um, you're, making, you're making it difficult to read or release documents. I think you have to say, like, you know, you have to tell people that this is what you're going to do. Um, you know, with that transparency, if you're going to make scientists you know, and be able to release the studies, we're like, where is your focus on science going to be? And then you create the momentum for, you know, for, you know, a renewal of science, you know, over the next little while, and spending perhaps more, you know, investing more money, you know, even taxpayer money on, you know, when you look at the allocation of money on science. So it's not enough just to say we're going to be different, and tell people how you're going to be different. And uh, a great opportunity. So, I think there is huge opportunities to change things around. It can be done quickly with the right leadership. Sir. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering if you have any instruments when you're doing budgeting to look at the value of the public good. Now, in full disclosure, I'm a farmer, so this is a slightly biased question. 
But I look at the cuts that are being made to the agricultural department in terms of public plant breeding, uh, the closing of our prairie pasture programs, and the shuttering of the massive financial black hole that was the Indian Head Tree Nurseries. Uh, do, do parliamentarians or uh, the new parliamentary budget officer, do they have the ability to weigh the public good of something as public plant breeding versus a private sector model? in terms of saying, well, you know, it's not a dollars and cents thing, but it does offer this to it. And uh, the second question I would have is, in your time in the office, did the Canadian Wheat Board come across your desk at any time? And uh, <coughs> what experience would you, uh, did you have, if any, with that? Thank you. Well, I think on the issue of uh, uh, value, you know, of, of, of you know, comparing, you know, one program to another program, different ways of, of doing things, like what can uh, economists and financial analysts bring to the table to support Parliament in those kinds of discussions? I mean, first, like we felt, actually, we had, you know, in our, in our organization, we spent time right at the beginning saying, like, what is our mission? And our mission for us was that we're just, you know, whatever we do, we just want to be, promote transparency, and we want to get really excited when, 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 when uh, members of Parliament use financial analysis when, you know, when they're making decisions. And so that was our mission. And so for us, when, you know, we, in 2012, when the cutting started, you know, you know, we need to get back to balance. You know, we did analysis on what the impacts of the cuts would be overall, just from a macro perspective. You know, then, you know, because we couldn't generate a plan ourselves, we, you know, we couldn't look at the risk around the plan, risk to service levels, that, you know, really the impacts that you're referring to, sir, you know, on, on, far, on the farming community, on Canadians as a result. Like, you know, uh, we basically said, we got a problem. Like, we, you, know, we, you know, Parliament we cannot get this information. So that, again, in, in the budget, it deals with how you're allocating your money, and, you know, across, you know, farming programs, other programs. So we never got the plan. And, uh, you know, we argued for over a year to say, like, where are those cuts happening? And then, so, like, my view is, again, going back to, you know, we, we know, and because I, I was involved as a public servant developing these reviews of departments, they, you know, before they, you know, the department you know, at some point in time would have had to go into the prime minister's office and, and the cabinet and said, "Here's our here's our package of cuts. You're telling us that you need to find 50 million, say whatever, on agriculture basis, you know, whatever it is, one and a half billion dollars, and here's where we're making your cuts. We're getting rid of environmental programs and other programs." Like, and, then, and then they would have to justify what their priorities were, where were the inefficiency programs, why did you choose those? Like to me, a lot of that work could actually be made available to all parliamentarians at a standing committee. And deputy ministers could be brought in and could explain with the evaluations on the programs, here's the evidence that I used to decide that on this cut vis-a-vis -vis that cut. At the end of the day, the parliamentarian has to explain it and they made the choice. But I think the analysis, the evaluations that would have been done in these programs are done effectively by public servants, and that should have been released. It was never released. So as the budget officer, you can't pick to say, you know, I'm gonna look at the wheat board. I was never asked to look at the wheat board. And you can't pick to say, I'm gonna focus on agriculture. I worked at agriculture. I worked in foreign financial programs for a few years. Um, those requests come from parliamentarians. But we were enough to say that we knew like, there was systemic failure in the system and the government was saying, we're not giving you any plans. We're not telling you where the cuts are. And, and then you effectively took Parliament right out of the game. And um, so that's basically why we went to federal court. And I didn't, as I said earlier today, I didn't get invited to any cocktail parties <laughs> uh, from any deputy ministers after we did that. Before, uh, can I, just, I just want to emphasize that the people on this side of the room are putting the people on this side of the room to shame. <laughs> so I want to see some people not <laughs> That's you, Ralph. Hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks very much for your presentation tonight. Um, when you brought it up earlier, uh, you mentioned climate change, and, and when the farmer asked about the wheat board, I wondered if you've come across anything in specific to climate change or uh, oil policy and, and what it's costing uh, Canadians right now. Yeah, we, um, was, that'd be a great issue. Actually, maybe a good issue for my, my new endeavor, which is to try to create an, 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 an process, try to create an institute of public finance at the University of Ottawa. And um, I think you know, the president at the university feels that you know we need to do invest more of that you know, time and energy at those sorts of issues. So we didn't do it while I was the parliamentary budget officer, but I wouldn't certainly rule it out. 
to do climate change. I'd love to do climate change with environmental work at the Institute of Public Fiscal Studies at the University of Ottawa, which needs to be created. First of all, thank you, uh, you and your office for a light in a very dark Servants have a role to play. I had a role to play, and um, to, you know, to do the analysis that we did, whether you know it's on those, you know, those, like fighter planes. And um, to be honest, how it felt, uh, it felt, it felt pretty scary. Like when we did, you know, when we first came out with our, our study, I knew, that, you know, the government had released like one sheet of paper and said we can get these fighter planes for sixteen billion dollars, and. Um, so then we did like a study, and I don't know what it was, 50, 75 pages, and we got it peer reviewed by people in the United States uh, and in Canada, and the numbers were so different. And, and you know, we were using uh, a model from a, a U United K UK company that was helping us do this work, and again, we kept going back peer review, going back to make sure, are these numbers like in the ballpark? And I remember, it was one of the really lonely times, and uh, I actually remember getting a call from a member of parliament the, the night before I was in my office and he said, Kevin, it's not going to be an easy day for you tomorrow, releasing that paper. And then we got blasted. And, um, and I remember, like the, but I remember as well, like we felt comfortable with the work. Like we thought it was very good work. And, um, but then I remember, like, honestly, every year I go to Cuba at a certain time with another family that we, well, we lost, like you lost a child, this other family lost a child, we disappeared for one week. And I got a call, and uh, we were literally like, you know, on the beach doing probably drinking or something, you know, <laughs> smoking a cigar or something. And I got a call, and you know, there was, the AG report came out. And the Auditor General report basically said that you know, military officials, bureaucrats, effectively worked for the Department of National Defense, went to cabinet with numbers that were bigger than our numbers. So, you know, they, and again, I had worked in that system on, you know, in launch event, I'm taking, you know, I'd be one of those people that would write notes to the Prime Minister saying, you know, this looks good, this doesn't look good, or some version of that, and you should approve this, and once they were approved by Cabinet, and I, would, I would write these, recommend, you know, these, you know, these records and stuff. So that was all known, you know, that, you know, d and &E officials, even though they were blasting us for saying, you know, we are, our estimates were grossly exaggerated, 
Well, they were doing that. They knew that they had, they went to the Prime Minister to get decision support with numbers that were bigger than ours. And I said, holy smokes. I can't say it felt good. It, was, it, it just felt like a bit of, there was a bit of a release that, um, meaning again, the importance of an Auditor General and actually the importance of a, a primary budget officer who does the work at the front end and an Auditor General gets to come in at the, you know, and basically look at the process or actually even look at, you know, after the money spent. And now, a few years from now, an Auditor General is going to look at the, the wastewater facility. Did the P3 work? Did they get the savings they expected? And that's what, but you know, again, you want like the center policy alternatives or whatever, or a legislative budget officer to come in before and provide all the information you can to stimulate that debate. Thank you. Well, thanks again for coming to Regina. I really appreciate the talk. It's the easiest place to come to. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Thunder Bay. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I guess I really appreciated what you mentioned about transparency and accountability, especially from the public service and you should expect that. So I guess I was just wondering what advice you would have for bureaucrats perhaps that do struggle with that and how to perhaps bring some of that transparency and accountability from within. Um, what would be kind of the path to help get that uh, greater accountability into the system? Yeah. Well. It, um, a few weeks ago, I was asked to speak at a, at a public service event in Montreal. And I think it was like an IPAC event. There's like 500 people there, and a deputy minister's there. They wanted me to speak about public service renewal. And I have to tell you, like, that really got me anxious to just to speak to public servants about public service renewal. And because I didn't feel, I felt like, like, wow, we really needed renewal, like in a big, in a, sooner rather than later. And so I basically went and read the, you know, the clerk of the Privy Council's office blueprint for renewal, and it said things like, we want to modernize our workplace. I said, yeah, well, like, everybody wants to modernize their workplace. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and it, there were other, a few other things, uh, you know, become more efficient, et cetera, like that. I said, you know, I basically read it and said, like, that's not a recipe for renewal. So then I went to their, their values, which I said, you know, values are something like, you know, most people, like, even looking at this room, they don't really change. You know, the world changes, but hopefully you can keep the same values. So I read through the values of the, you know, the Public Service Charter passed in 2012, and it had things like accountability and transparency on it. You know, it had, it had other things you know, on it about you know, being honest and professional, doing good, providing good advice. But on that issue, so I told, I had like, no problems telling 500 people, like, you did not do that on accountability and transparency. Like, and, there were, and I gave them the examples. And I think until like you actually get to the point, just feel comfortable. Like these are not evil people, but you're not. You know, you, you, you know the the, the the clerk's recipe is not a recipe for renewal. Like, we got big problems to fix, and transparency is, is one of them. Doing the work, the analysis, making it available to all Canadians so they can see, so they can be held accountable. And I think uh, that is a recipe for a renewal. And you know what? You can't get bright students to come to work in the public service and then tell them you, you can't do the work. You know, all these issues that we're talking about here today, they want to do the work. They, get, they, they want to be motivated to do the work. They want to be inspired to do the work. So, um, yeah, there's a huge opportunity to do, to do renewal in the public service. And how does it happen? And I effectively also said I didn't think it was going to happen with the current leadership. Again, I get no other invites for, for cocktail parties. <laughs> and uh, no trouble. You know, and I like these people. I, you know, I played hockey with some of these deputy ministers. They don't ask me to play hockey anymore with them. I uh, even prefer to play hockey with them even more now. <laughs> but you know, they're, you know, they're nice people and they're, they're under pressure. You know, and I said to them, you know, I, said, I don't think you, you know, you know, when you're thinking about renewal, like you should be thinking 10 years ahead, five years ahead, what the world's going to look like. like. 10 years ago, we should be thinking about what if we ran into a government that's very ideological? and a government that wasn't going to share information. How are you going to respond? How do you maintain your values? Again, that was a question we never really anticipated. It seemed like an, an unknown at that time. But it's not really an unknown. It's not a bad thing to have ideology. But it is a bad thing to say, you know what? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, going, to be, I'm going to ignore all the facts. You know, I'm going to make it difficult to get facts out. But that is not a good thing. So, I mean, I think public servants, they have to stand up. They have to be, you know, I think really I have more faith in the current generation of students that are at the University of Regina that are going to come in and take over these public service jobs and that they're going to make that change happen. 
That's why you never give, I can never turn down an opportunity to be here or work at the University of Ottawa. Like, I do have faith in that generation. But I'm actually really disappointed at my generation for passing off the institutions in the shape that they're in right now. And, and the fact that we're not dealing with some of these laws. I'm just, I'm disappointed in myself that we're going to do more. Sir. Uh, Mr. Page, uh, your, uh, your tenure as uh, <coughs> budget officer uh, has uh, been a remarkable period of, uh, of uh, professionalism and, and courage uh, that is truly admired by, by the vast majority of Canadians. And I think those who are no longer inviting you to cocktail parties uh, are really uh, the losers in that endeavor. I mean, there are a lot of ordinary Canadians who would dearly love to have you inside <laughs> at their parties. <laughs> Sunshine. He was the deputy director. And you see, you see, he was there right at the very beginning in '75 when they created the Congressional Budget Office. Been around there ever since. I've met him on many occasions subsequently. But I remember he said three things to me. He said, Captain, I'm going to give you three pieces of advice. And I, and I like it when people do that. And he said, you know, Number one, you got to do quality work. Because, you know, your first bad project, you're going to be in trouble. And it's going to be really hard to get your reputation back. So you, oh, your work has to be of high quality. So like he was helping us do peer review, like we'll help you out on projects, if you phone us, we'll give you help on how to do fiscal sustainability work, et cetera, et cetera. Like a really nice open man. Number two, he said, you're gonna have to learn how to communicate. And he said, just, you know, just be yourself. You know, it's a good message to all the students. Don't be anybody but yourself. Just, you know, explain things. Because some of the stuff that you do, you're costing fighter planes, or, you know, we built complicated models looking at our prison system to cost crime bills. You just have to find a way to speak to all people. Speak to academics, speak to members of parliament, speak to Canadians, speak to young kids, speak to old kids. Just learn how to do that. Don't be afraid of doing that. And then the third thing he said to me, he said, you're going to have to be tough. He says, because they're going to try to fire you. And I said, what? <laughs> like, I haven't even, I've been doing the job for two months. <laughs> he says, you know, I haven't even, we haven't even, barely started working on any project, and he says, yeah, they're gonna try to fire. And then he was like right on everything. And so a very wise man, he'd been there, you know, you know, one of these people that stayed in the institution, highly regarded, respected by all people, and um, you know, so they would share their advice on like how to release documents, you know, how to put together some of these documents. We had you know, easy access, like it was easier. You know, if we had a problem, we would almost phone them as, before we phone a federal department to get information. <laughs> you know, some some cases, because we did a lot of military procurement work, and it was just, they do so much of that, it was easier to do. But I think I was always impressed with that office, just the quality of the work they did. Like, you're re reading their documents. Way back, I used to forecast the U.S. economy when I was at the Department of Finance in the 80s. 
and just, they did good work, and they had really good staff. And, you, you could, and I remember going in different buildings in the United States. I'd walk into their building, and you know how it's like, like there's energy in the room. You know, the analysts were talking, and everybody's happy, and they're comparing notes. And then I'd go, like I'd walk down the road, go to the general accountability office, and there's like nobody in the room. And it's, like it's really quiet, and no one's talking. And then I'd walk down the road, and I would go to the office of management and budget, and same thing, everybody's, you know, kind of uptight, and kind of like not a lot of sharing of information. So they created this nice atmosphere. And I remember, like, you know, once I found myself, like, around these former directors of the Congressional Budget Office, and they were, like, giggling and they're telling them about all the stories. Oh, yeah, I remember when Nixon did this, and then Carter did this, and, and I'm saying, whoa, I would love to be part of that in the middle of those debates. You know, and just to have that experience kind of rub off to, and again, like, you don't, it doesn't rub off unless you put yourself out in harm's way, like you take on those big projects. So he was basically telling us that if you want to be relevant, you've got to be working on the big files. And Mr. Sunshine was, even though he was like 65, he was working on Obama's health care package. He was like in charge of the congressional budget up. He was under major heat. But he took the time out and said, no, I've got to speak to this guy. Never forgot that, those simple things, those gestures. Um, but there's actually right now, a guy hosted in, in, I think, February of this year, 22 countries, legislative budget office, always said he asked Canada to host. You know, and including the United States was you know, visited us, the Office of Budget Responsibility from the UK, Australia. Next week I'm going to the Slovak Republic, and I'm, I sit on their advisory panel <coughs> uh, for their legislative budget office. Two weeks after that I go to South Korea. I'm on, you know, to actually they've got a big budget office, and they've asked, and we talk about fiscal sustainability, that really boring stuff, right? Yeah. And but you know, we share notes and all these sort of stuff, and we get together as a community. So they actually always they put together principles. So we basically, you know, on a legislative budget office, you know, who you hire, how you release products, you know, how you manage your resources, how you pick projects, and we follow that. That's a guidebook for us. And so, in, in, you know, I think it's like it's a real community now to try to strengthen institutions because it's not just a Canadian issue. Like God knows, like you could, you know, watch CNN or read the New York Times in the morning, you know, you Google up something. That's, other institutions are struggling as well, but there is a cost to weak institutions. And uh, we don't, so I, and I think uh, Mr. Good is right. We don't want to get any, we don't want to get weaker. We need to get stronger. So, but yeah, we just, we, we, like, we basically, in some ways, plagiarized everything. And, you know, we didn't steal their forecast, but we said, like, how do you do fiscal sustainability? So, well, here, we'll help you out. Like, how do you estimate fighter planes? We'll help you out. Like, how do you estimate ships? We'll help you out. And then, you know, I, we started working with public servants, and you watch these public servants, all of a sudden they're like, they're energized. You know, we get these like, oh, this is going to be a problem. Like our first project, we're going to cost the war. And then you know, once you start, you build confidence over, over time. And that's just, it's fun to do that, you know. And then again, it's, it gets, but it's still writing papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but it's that process of, yeah, and that's the fun part. It's just, it's just amazing to do that. So, like for the students that are here today, to get yourself, you know, working, get your chance to meet, you know, these sorts of people that can help you, you can learn from, and not be afraid to take on those projects. Boy, they can go a long way. Hi there. You mentioned in, uh, investing money in Aboriginal health and water programs, but those are tree rights. So, I'm just wondering why money would be invested in specific programs that aim to meet those inherent rights of Aboriginal peoples? Yeah, I think the government, uh, we, you know, we have, the government has a vote, a grant and contribution vote, it's probably in the neighborhood of $8 billion, split up with all sorts of things, economic development, health, uh, education, water. I don't know what our spending right now is, like probably in the neighborhood of a few hundred million a year on, 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 on water programs that's transferred. Um, to our original communities. I mean, I'm not sure if I understand your point. Like, for us, we don't question, like, you know, is there, you know, is this, you know, where's the legislative authority to do this? We have, we are, you know, the government is doing this now. Is that your point? Like, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. We should be finding different related relationships with Aboriginal peoples, and we should be transferring these sorts of resources to Aboriginal people. I just mean, like, is it because of the complexities involved in achieving, keeping the promises? It, it seems kind of like a baby step process, like bit by bit, you know, putting money towards water, putting money towards education, health. Like it seems like possibly a gradual process. Would you call it something like that? 
yeah, could you transition to a very different world where actually Aboriginal people are providing like their own, you know, their own health and water kind of resources? But again, these are public goods for the most part. I mean, the big debate that went on in the referendum yesterday was a water issue. We tend to treat these as public goods, like everybody should have access to, uh, to, to you know, to, to water and should have access to good healthcare programs. Like, I mean, I, just as a Canadian citizen, until like we can get, you know, if we can improve governance relations, that would be great. But I don't. Like, I, I don't have uh, personally have a problem with us like, transferring money to Aboriginal people so they have good health, good water, good educational uh, facilities. And rather than have better, especially at a point in time we have a young, as everybody knows, a very young Aboriginal population in this country. Would you say that's like the first step in achieving, keeping these promises? Like, making programs that are specific to certain things that are their rights? Well, I think, I mean, if, if, if there's different programs, there's programs on, on land rights and, you know, where there's, again, commitments that we have to Aboriginal people for basic public services. Um, I mean, as your point is that we should, re we should rethink that in a kind of a 21st century world, that we should have a different split of resources. Um, as a budget officer, that was never my mandate, you know, to, to question that stuff. Uh, if, um, if somebody asked me, you know, again, back to the educational, educational issue where we did, we did do work. Um, you know, basically, do we have a model in place? You know, if we're responsible for, for, for education for Aboriginal people on reserve, and we have these facilities, and we have 800 structures, we spend like two billion plus on post-secondary education for Aboriginal people. And I can, you know, is it, I think, I was very comfortable looking at that and then comparing it with what, what exists in the provinces, you know, that they provide. So. It, that benchmarking work wasn't like a problem for us to do. I was comfortable doing that, but making questions on should we be spending more or less? I think, I think I'd be happy if if parliamentarians voted on specific for Aboriginal people. They voted on economic development programs as a vote. That they voted on health and water programs as a vote. They voted on education as a vote. So that you know what often happens in times of stress and budgets are being cut back is that deputy ministers and cabinet ministers are making decisions and nobody sees it. Because all those programs, health and water, economic development, they're all lumped into one big grand contribution vote that's worth about eight billion dollars. So there's no control. So it becomes very, much, very much like that. You know, water removing monies from a border infrastructure to a legacy type program kind of stuff. I think we need, you know, just more transparency like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can make you a comment on your own risk in your position as PBO. Uh, there's the expression, by all means be brave, but don't be suicidal. Uh, you feel that in retrospect, in some ways, that you were possibly too brave, or in other cases, possibly not brave enough. So if you had it to do all over again, uh, considering what the trade-offs are, that if you're alive, you can do a lot more uh, than if you're not in that job anymore. Yeah. Well, I said to the students today that, um, about two years before I took the job, I lost a son in an accident. And he was, the, he was my oldest son. And uh, he, and so it just, I, I said, like, the, for me, it was an epiphany. Like, there's no security. There's just no security. Like, people, like, you say, oh, I'm going to be a public servant, and I'm going to have a great career. I'll retire at 65, I'm going to have all these sorts of things. And then, like, boom, all of a sudden, it just disappears. Everything you love, gone. And then like, it's like for me, like, you know, there's a lot of pain that goes through that. You can, you, know, you can do whatever you want with the pain. You can say, I'm going to do something positive to honor memory, or you could say, you know, I'm just going to drink a lot. Um, and, um, and just it felt more better just to say, maybe I could try to do something positive. So like, it, it, when you see, like, I mean, if there is no security, like financial security, if you can lose your health that quickly, or, like, you know, honestly, a few weeks ago we had a train accident about a few blocks from where I live where we lost six people, two kids about the same age as my son, who also died by a train. And I ride my bike by that place every day. And I, mean, I could just imagine what those parents feel like. You know, 21 year old kids going to Carleton University, gone. Like, how does that even happen? You know, like, you know the, the, the things you love more than anything else in the world, your kids. So then you start to say, then the prime minister says, no, I'm cutting your budget. Ah, oh, fine, cut it. <laughs> <laughs> the prime minister said, you know, or the you know, cabinet minister said, you know, you're unbelievable, you're unreliable, you're incredible. Like, I can't believe, like, your, your estimates. Oh, that's fine, then we're comfortable with them. Where's yours? <laughs> Like, you know, if, you're, if you're 
given the, you know, under the legislation, you're given the, the responsibility to provide parliament analysis on the economy, on the nation's finances, scrutiny of the estimates costing. Like, if you, like, for me, like, I gulped. I didn't, one of the reasons not to take the job, that was too much mandate for me. Like, that's just a scary thing. And I, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in jobs I had before. I could pick up the phone, I could say, you know, I'm phoning for the Prime Minister, I'm in the Privy Council office, I'm his Assistant Secretary, I need some analysis on a, you know, a tax change. You know, change the tax legislation. And people say, yes, sir, right away. I, you, know, you don't get that help at the Department of Budget Office. So, um, <laughs> They would, you know, they're not that going to be that kind of supporter. So, like, it was scary to take on that kind of job. But I mean, the, the team that came and wanted to do the work, they're, they're the real heroes. They actually did the work. You know, and, uh, and so a lot of people, there's a lot of Canadians willing to do this. A lot. I think, like, all the students that I talked to today are more than capable. And will do it. Will do it. I felt brave enough. But not crazy, not suicidal. <laughs> and actually, you know what? And, and people would say, like, oh, you lose your job. Like, honestly, I'm making more money than I ever did now. <laughs> Where's the downside? <laughs> <laughs> and I never, you know, honestly, if you don't know me, but I live in a bungalow, you know, far away from town, and I ride my bike to work. Like, I'm not a big shot. I grew up in a house my dad built. He was a machinist. You know, I, I don't need any more. Like, I, I already eat too much, I drink too much. <laughs> what else do I want? I have more than enough clothes than I need. Like, I don't need anything more. Like, actually, I very, was very happy being a public servant. So, like, where is the fear? We'll make this our last part. Okay. So, you were talking about the importance of the debate, and my question is, um, what should the next debate be in Parliament? <laughs> yeah, I hope, like the speech in the throne, which I would probably get tabled, you know, whatever, 15th or 16th, I've lost track of time, and uh, in October. It's, you know, I hope it's not, I hope it's a document that's long-term in school. You know, that, you know the, the parliamentarians are going to say, yeah, the economy is sluggish right now, but here's where we want to take it to the future. Here's the investments that we need to make. You know, I hope that, for example, on the health care issue, which is gobbling up provincial budgets, it's only going to get worse as we get older over the next two decades, like, I hope, like, you know, that, you know, because it's not the government, it's the opposition party saying, you know what, we're going to tackle this. Like, we should probably have a royal commission. We should be making decisions over the next few years. We need to put some analysis on the table. You know, and I hope, like, you know, in, you know people talk about income inequality and those sorts of issues and social programs, whether we have the right social programs to deal with this. I don't see inequality getting, you know, getting better. I think it gets worse the way our economies are set up. It's certainly getting worse in the United States. We could see some pressure before the recession in Canada. So like, basically, what are the policies that we want five to five years from now they're going to deal with these sorts of issues so everybody gets economic opportunity? You know, because that is the big issue. Like, honestly, back just from my boring story, I grew up in a house my dad built. My dad's a machinist. I got to do jobs to, you know, to get to go to an education. I got to go to school. I had opportunity, amazing opportunity. Like, I, you know, school was affordable. Even if it's just, for, you know, I was able to pay my student loans and the rest of it. That's a good country. What are people dying for in the Middle East right now? Housing, education, water. They're dying for it. The kids, like the, the ones I talked to today, the same age, they're, they're willing to die for it now. It's become such an issue. So, but it, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be like that in Canada. You know, it could be like, we're, it's not like that in Canada. So, yeah, I want them to talk about these issues like statesmen. Not just about what's in it, like, yeah, pensions and health care for my generation, but pensions and health care for the, the, your gen the kid's generation that's here today. You know, so parliamentarians say, you know, I'm going to get back to fiscal balance. Don't do it for me. Do it for our kids. And uh, so that they have, you know, again, going back to the, you know, dead interest charges. So Minister Mar Martin had to spend 38 cents in every revenue dollar for pub public dead interest charges. Minister Flaherty had 13 cents. Let's keep it at 13 cents. But let's give you, the, you know, let's give the next generation the choice. So good fiscal management is very important. Minister Goodell did a damn good job too. Actually, yeah. as a finance minister. Yeah. Okay. I can go on. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, you can talk about the environment, et cetera, et cetera. But you want, I think it's about priorities and policy directions. And then let's start the work. We don't have to make all the decisions in the 2014 budget. Let's just get, let's do our homework. 
we didn't do our homework on a lot of files over the last few years. It's starting out. And you know, everybody can contribute. Universities can contribute. The new the Parliamentary Budget Office can contribute. Everybody can, you know, chip in. Center for Policy Alternatives will definitely <coughs> chip in. Definitely chip in. Thank you.